Tonight on TVS, Second Thoughts. Is there anything worse than trying to have a conversation with someone who's had a drink when you haven't? Yes, trying to take off your tie without undoing the knot. <laughs> Is love really lovelier the second time around? I just don't know why you bother to come round here at all, Bill, if you just plan to argue with well, me. Well, actually, I plan to seduce you, but you put me off the whole idea. <laughs> Faith and Bill share second thoughts tonight at 8 on TVS. Next tonight, the news at 5.40. Frida and Greta are identical twins. They dress alike, walk in step, and even talk in unison. They do everything together and must be able to see each other at all times. If separated, even for a moment, they become hysterical, and it upsets them if people stare. Shout that loud to the shout, shout that loud to the stop it, to the stop it. Shout that loud to the stop it. Everything must be identical, even down to the smallest detail. A pair of one. Tonight's short story at 8.30 on 4. For today's breakfast special, we have our very own diet muesli and a light maple sauce with a topping of yogurt. Kellogg's cornflakes, please. Just Kellogg's cornflakes? Please. Weird. Weird. Kellogg's cornflakes, delicious golden flakes of corn drenched in ice cold milk. You know, I kind of forgotten how these taste. They're good. They're real good. They're gone. They're, They're gone. gone. They're gone. Gone. So I brought you the special? Kellogg's cornflakes. Have you forgotten how good they taste? Full of life, your whiskers kitten. He loves his whiskers kitten food. Full of kindness, your whiskers cat. She deserves her whiskers. Young or old, cats instinctively know what they like and what's good for them. Cats would buy whiskers. Welcome to the Classic Experience, 33 of the world's most popular classics, Classic Experience 3. The new tasting St. Idle Gold with a more buttery flavour, but still only half the fat of butter, St. Idle Gold. The Old Town Jail in Dover is one of Kent's newest attractions. Come and experience a real-life Victorian horror story. The Old Town Jail, Dover. Nice try, Fido. But nothing delivers the news faster than Oracle. <laughs> the ultimate newspaper. That's Gardening visits the Chelsea Flower Show this week. Set in the grounds of the Chelsea Royal Hospital, the Royal Horticultural Society's Great Spring Show is the most prestigious event of the British gardening year. Debbie Thrower, Helen Biddlecombe and Chris Baines will be enjoying the sights and sounds, colour and contrast and the behind-the-scenes stories that make up the show. So settle down and savour the multicoloured delights of the Chelsea Flower Show in That's Gardening, tonight at half past six on TVS. And that's followed by Through the Keyhole at seven. Tonight in Coast to Coast, the student with a phone bill for eight and a half thousand pounds, and what's more, it's genuine. And the window wiping boys, the AA, say they're a danger and a nuisance. The full story at six o'clock. Mortgage rates cut as interest rates come down. Gandhi funeral, millions mourn. Wanted homes for 400 experiment dogs. And England beat the West Indies just. Good evening. Mortgage rates were reduced today after the government ordered a further cut in interest rates. It's a fifth cut in interest rates this year. The bank base rate fell half of 1% to 11.5%. The Halifax then cut its mortgage rate by the same amount to just under 12.5%. Other lenders made cuts too. The man who lives at number 11 Downing Street has been under intense pressure from business leaders to cut interest rates. Today he was able to deliver. I'm very pleased that we've been able to make another half point uh, reduction in interest rates. This means they've now come down three and a half points 
since last October. And this is a result of the really very excellent progress we're making on getting inflation down. But the Governor of the Bank of England says inflation isn't coming down fast enough. He's been resisting demands for lower rates. Today's half percentage reduction is probably a compromise. It is enough for the building societies to reduce mortgage rates. Usually they wait for a full one percentage drop in the cost of borrowing. But the nationwide Anglia broke ranks and lowered its rate two weeks ago. And rival lenders feel they have to keep pace. Our mortgage rate is now 12.45, which is the lowest for two and a half years. So it should help, together with the discounts that we offer first-time buyers, it should help get the house, housing market moving again. The half percentage reduction will mean that on a £30,000 repayment mortgage, a homeowner will save £8 a month. On a 60000 loan, £19 a month. On a £90,000 loan, £30 a month. But for manufacturing industry as opposed to homeowners, today brought little to lighten the gloom of recession. A survey today from the CBI says the cost of borrowing must be lowered further to fuel a recovery. Labour welcomed the fall in interest rates, but they said the government should have cut them by a full percentage point. The Liberal Democrats accused the government of economic mismanagement. England's former cricket captain David Gower fielded a difficult catch in Downing Street today for the Prime Minister, to the obvious relief of both of them. And after Mr Major had signed a cricket bat for charity, he confirmed his government was aiming for a long innings. I've just settled in. <laughs> Opening over is barely, barely finished. He then replied to Labour's charge that the cut in interest rates should have been 1%. Yes, that's what they said last time, and then subsequently they said in 87 when we did it, we created inflation by doing it too fast. But Labour still said the government had got it wrong. No, I think the government should have cut interest rates today by a full percentage point. Industry is in severe and deep recession, uh, and it was necessary to give it a stimulus by a full percentage point cut. But they've dithered again and have failed to act as decisively as the circumstances require. My own view is that it's a very great pity uh, that it can't be more yet and, uh, and that it can't be more because the government's got the economy into the sort of state in which we've got to come down cautiously. The Chancellor and the Prime Minister know that this move will give Tory backbenchers some good news to take back to their constituencies this Whitson holiday. They must also be hoping that it will help reduce Labour's substantial lead in the opinion polls. Jo Andrews, ITN, Westminster. Tens of thousands of people this afternoon filed past Rajiv Gandhi's funeral pyre in the Indian capital, Delhi. It was lit earlier by Rajiv's son, Raoul. The mourners included the Prince of Wales, the Foreign Secretary, Douglas Hurd, and the opposition leader, Neil Kinnock. Our diplomatic editor, Edward Sturton, is in Delhi. Arms reversed, all three services forming up for the Guard of Honour the formality with which the state pays tribute to a former Prime Minister. But the people of India wanted to show their feelings for a leader who was more than a politician to them. As his body was brought out to be laid on a gun carriage, they almost overwhelmed those guarding it. Rajiv's widow, with her private grief, lost in the crowd. A slow march and the procession left the house where the Gandhi dynasty began the home of Nehru, Rajiv's grandfather. The people of Delhi had come to bid farewell to the man whose death may mark the end of that dynasty. Everywhere along the route, anywhere they could find to stand. They filled the Rajput, centre of Indian government since the days of British rule. Rajiv Gandhi sat here for half a decade as Prime Minister, and this looked at times almost like yet another of those many triumphal Gandhi election celebrations which India has so often seen since independence. A helicopter scattered petals on the crowd. For many of those beneath, the government has always meant the Gandhis. But the grief of the old affected the young. This generation will grow up under a new political order. Only at the funeral pyre was the body of Rajiv returned for a while to the attentions of his family. His son Raoul, a student in America, being guided through the ritual by a Hindu priest. And daughter-comforted mother, Sonia Gandhi, may soon be back at the centre of India's turbulent election campaign. But for today, she has been a widow doing her Hindu duty. Rajiv Gandhi's death had drawn friends and admirers from all over the world. Prince Charles was here, 
and close by the Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Cremation is the traditional form of Hindu funeral. Hindus believe that fire frees the soul and it's said the soul hovers by the ashes for 13 days while it's judged by the gods. Rajiv Gandhi was sometimes harshly judged by his political opponents, but he is likely to be remembered above all as one of democracy's martyrs. Rajiv Gandhi's assassination took place in the midst of the most violent election campaign in India's history. Here at least, that seems to have been forgotten today. Political disputes have been put to one side. But once the mourning is over, the campaign will resume as vigorously as ever. Edward Sturton, ITN, Delhi. Indian communities in Britain are also in mourning for Rajiv Gandhi. Many shops and businesses closed as a mark of respect. David Chater visited one Hindu temple in Glasgow. In hundreds of Hindu temples throughout Britain today, mantras of peace were being chanted in memory of Rajiv Gandhi. Here in Glasgow, the Shok Sabha, or morning prayers, began as the former Indian Prime Minister's funeral procession neared the cremation site on the banks of the River Jamuna. Thousands of miles distant, but their thoughts and their prayers were on that far away river bank. Thoughts shared right across the Indian community, across the religious divides. I think I could say that the whole community is really stunned. Uh, the news really has been very tragic. And even now we find it's very, very hard to believe that this has happened. Well, he'll be missed very badly because the whole population was looking towards him as uh, to make a stable government. We miss the great leader. So we might get together and find some solution to make a good India again. The service ended with a minute's silence and a prayer that Rajiv Gandhi's soul might find peace. David Chater, ITN, in Glasgow. Doctors say they have proof that a straightforward operation can reduce the chances of strokes for high-risk patients by half. Many strokes are caused by blood clots blocking the arteries which supply the brain. The £2,000 operation widens the arteries in the neck and allows the blood to flow more freely. Surgery on the arteries that feed the brain with blood, called the carotids, was developed in the 50s. But until the trial published today, surgeons were not sure whether it really worked or not. Now they know it does, but only for the most badly affected patients. X-rays show that the two carotid arteries, right and left, are very narrow. In some patients who've already had mild strokes, the arteries are almost blocked by a build-up of fatty deposits. Bits breaking off these deposits enter the brain, the white spots, and can cause strokes. The operation to clear out the arteries does prevent further, more serious strokes, but the operation itself can cause strokes. The study published today shows that if the obstruction is less than 30%, surgery is too risky. If the blockage is between 30 and 70%, it's an open question. But over 70%, and surgery can cut the risks of strokes by half. This 77-year-old had the operation yesterday. He and thousands like him have a much better chance after surgery of not suffering disabling or fatal strokes. The RSPCA today launched an appeal to find homes for more than 400 beagles bred for animal experiments. The dogs are homeless because of the planned closure of private kennels in Worcestershire. Last year, 79 beagle puppies from the kennels suffocated on a ship while being taken to laboratories in Sweden. RSPCA rescue teams arrived just hours after the kennel owners moved out. They're tasked to find homes for 400 dogs bred for experiments. For these 16-week-old puppies, first sight of daylight. First sight, too, of people other than their feeders at this one of Britain's biggest dog farms. Conditions are basic. Dogs have been penned in huts with little light or fresh air. They're bewildered, nervous and subdued. Their run have been both their sleeping quarters, their eating quarters, their uh, relieving area. Their total environment has just been the space of a cage about 10 feet by 6 feet. The RSPCA are now in control of Perricroft, paying the £1,600 a week costs to care for the 400 dogs. They're hoping loving homes can be found, but they've no illusions about the problems. These animals in particular 
need people who've got a lot of patience, a lot of time, and a lot of love to give them. They've got a lot to, give for, to forgive humanity for. Animal rights demonstrators showed their delight at the takeover. The dogs are now on their way to RSPCA centers, saved from the uncertainty of life at Perricroft and the certainty of death in experimental labs across Europe. Eric McInnes, ITN, Malvern, Worcestershire. And if you're interested in giving one of the beagles a home, please don't ring us. Call the RSPCA. Creditors of Polypec International today backed a plan to rescue the collapsed multinational conglomerate. Administrators have been running the business since it crashed last October, owing more than a billion pounds. The chairman, Azil Nadir, is on bail after being charged with theft and false accounting. Creditors arrived this morning facing a stark choice to opt for immediate liquidation of the company or back an attempt to continue running it in order to salvage what money they can. The administrators put forward a long-term restructuring plan aiming to stabilize the finances of Polypec and ultimately minimize the losses of the shareholders. The men now in charge of this strategy won the backing of the creditors and the survival plan will go ahead. Our belief is that um, handled properly and following a constructive course of action, we should be able to recover considerably greater sums and also put the group back on its footing um, as an ongoing business. The spectacular collapse of Polypec, which was led by the businessman Azil Nadir, caught many by surprise. Unraveling the complex finances of the group, which include the Del Monte fruit operation, has been the first phase of the salvage operation. So it seems likely that Polypec International will survive. For a company that crashed owing a billion pounds, that's being seen by the administrators as a major success. Robert Moore, ITN, North London. England's cricketers have won the first Texaco One Day International against the West Indies, thanks to an unbeaten 69 by Mike Atherton. But it's doubtful whether Ian Botham will play in the second One Day match tomorrow because of a muscle injury. The West Indies scored 173 for eight. This morning, England clinched victory by one wicket. For once, Ian Botham wasn't going to totally dominate the day. Though as he almost got run out, and in doing so pulled a muscle, he seemed to be trying to. His old pal Viv Richards was highly amused. Even more so when Walsh trapped him plumb in front, very next ball. <laughs> Definitely not in the hero's return script. That sparked a typical England collapse, Walsh starting it by getting Pringle. Russell was caught behind off Patterson. De Freitas snapped up by Richardson in the slips. And Lewis going the same way. It seemed like catching practice for the West Indies. But in increasing tension, Mike Atherton was still there, nudging vital singles while trying to protect last man Illingworth. He needn't have bothered. Illingworth was as safe as houses as England crept agonizingly towards the win. And it was number 11 Illingworth who settled it in the grand manner. Both of them couldn't have done it better. Well, he did brilliant at the end, coming in number 11, really. But it must have been very nerve wracking. Yeah, but. You know, you've got to have confidence in the guys, and he came out in his first game and, and never looked as though he was going to do anything else but get the runs. Man of the match for him, and the two deciding matches to look forward to over the weekend. Giles Smith, ITN Sport, Edgbaston. Channel 4 News is next from ITN at 7, from the news at 5.40. Good evening. <laughs> Well, good weather in store for most of us this bank holiday weekend. But as always, there's one or two exceptions. First of all, up in the northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland, a little more cloud and drizzle. And right down at the other extremity of the country in the southeast of England, it'll be cloudier and cooler too as those breezes come in off the North Sea. Everywhere else, dry, fine and warm. Temperatures their best and the most sun down on the southwest peninsula 
and the south of Wales. And that sets the scene very nicely for this evening's weather. A lovely finish to the day for most of us, but again, watch out for that cloud mist on the Western Isles and possibly a little bit of drizzle in the southeast. And the cloud cover has just broken in London here, so it is getting better all the time. Tonight, it's going to be very similar, but watch out for fog and mist patches developing and a bit of cloud just creeping inland as well. And that's the picture we inherit tomorrow morning. There will be some fog around first thing, but it'll very quickly be burnt off. Once again, it's that northwest of Scotland and Northern Ireland and the southeast that's cloudier. But as the day progresses, that better weather pushes right over to the eastern side of England and a much better picture for all of us. In fact, inland everywhere, temperatures are going to be great tomorrow between about 18 and 20. That's the upper 60s, if not the lower 70s down in the southwest there. However, all around the coastline, a different story. As those breezes come in off the sea, it's going to be much chillier. Most of you on the coast are going to be lucky to see 15 or 16. That's round about the 60 mark. And now finally, Sunday and Monday. First of all, Sunday there. Now that's going to be very similar to tomorrow's. It's those extremities again that suffer up in Scotland, mist, cloud, and maybe the odd bit of drizzle. Temperatures similar to tomorrow's. And on Monday, it's almost a repeat performance once again. But down in the southeast of England, those temperatures are falling only about 14. Join Alex later for an update. to go through. Why chance anything less? A quattro garden table and four chairs, all for just $34.99. It's got to be Texas, this bank holiday. If you were with the biggest building society in the world, you could now have a current account called Maxim. It could provide every service you need, from a checkbook to switch. It could even pay you interest, and you could use it anywhere in Britain. But in the end, where could you go for a Maxim current account? Halifax, the building society you can bank on. This weekend, all roads lead to Halfords Discount Drive 91. Halfords have made savage price cuts on road essentials like GTX Oil, Champion Spark Plugs, huge discounts on polish, car alarms, rally bikes, hundreds of Discount Drive bargains all weekend. Thank Halfords for that. The new Uncle Ben's stir-fry sauces make mealtimes more exciting. Just take Uncle Ben's great-tasting Thai curry sauce full of really crispy vegetables and stir-fry it with chicken for a delicious mouth-watering meal. Uncle Ben's stir-fry sauces offer you a taste of Thailand and perfect results every time. For sale, weekend home with views across the South Downs and the Yorkshire Dales. Excellent sailing and golf. Hot running water, cold running water. Good fishing, home cooking, Friendly neighbours, large back garden. When you own a caravan, great weekends and holidays are round the corner. Just get up and go. For a free guide, ask your dealer. Tonight jailed the couple who neglected a two-year-old boy. The student with a phone bill for £8,000. A warning that supermarket trolleys can damage your health. And the banker who's raising interest in his local Chinese. Good evening. A young couple who locked a toddler in a room where he eventually died have been jailed for willful neglect. Two-and-a-half-year-old Michael Brook died from a swelling on the brain. 
Michael's mother, 20-year-old Dawnbrook, and her boyfriend, Alistair Hall, who's 22, are tonight beginning six-month sentences. Lloyd Bracey reports. This is where little Michael Brooks' body was found in a room with no handle on the door. He'd lived there with his mother, Dawnbrook, and her boyfriend, Alistair Hall, who found the body. The couple have since moved. The boy had died of a swelling on the brain. He had a burn on his buttocks so deep it penetrated every layer of skin. His mother, Dawnbrook, first became pregnant at 13 and is now expecting again. She and Hall admitted willful neglect. They denied a charge of cruelty which was allowed to lie on the file. Brooks' lawyer said that she'd cared well for her little son until Hall moved in. She didn't take the boy to the doctor because she was afraid he'd be taken from her if she did. Sentencing them both to six months in custody, Mr Justice Elliott said he had enormous problems because large parts of the case would always remain a mystery. He had to strip all that away, he said, and deal with what could be established beyond doubt. He said, these two inadequate young people did not do what cried out to be done in respect of a little boy who eventually died. The case has aroused considerable public interest. After the couple's earlier court appearance, there were disturbances on the estate where the mother was living, as neighbours heard about what had happened to little Michael. Lloyd Bracey, Coast to Coast, Maston Crown Court. A student living on less than £35 a week has received a quarterly telephone bill for £8,500. Russell Codling from Maidstone allowed two people to stay in the house he rents. But while he was in lectures, they were making phone calls across the world. Richard Brock reports. Good morning. I was wondering how my telephone bill is coming along. Russell Codling, student. Weekly income, £31.25. Normal phone bill, £40 a quarter. Last quarter, £8,546.42. The price of his own good nature. He allowed two friends of friends to stay in his rented house for a few weeks. The telephone bill shows uh, reverse charge calls to America and, and uh, Pakistan and all over the world, really. I presume I, they stayed on the telephone all day, all the time we were at college. So. In fact, Russell's is a pay phone. What the two men did is disconnect it and use their own phone from his socket. They also used his name to check with British Telecom several times to find out the ever-increasing size of the bill. They disappeared and he's been unable to track them down. He's now paying off the bill at £20 a week. It's wrecking my studies at the moment and don't really know what to do. It's putting me on the back of your mind all the time. I thought about uh, going bankrupt, but that provides me with other problems like I can't get a bank account, uh, I can't get loans, and I'm worried about blacklisting anyway, yes. At £20 a week, it would take almost nine years to pay off the bill, but BT say it has to be paid off within one year. Yesterday, the company announced a profit of more than £3 billion, but they say there's no possibility of writing off the debt. Russell is now consulting a solicitor. Richard Brock, Coast to Coast. A stretch of motorway which opened just two days ago is already under attack for being too noisy. The people complaining live alongside the new M20 section between Maidstone and Ashford. As Paul Beard reports, they say the problem is caused by the road's special surface. Until last Wednesday, the only thing to disturb the peace in Charing Heath had been the bird song. But suddenly, a way of life was shattered as the missing link of the M20 between Hollingbourne and Ashford was opened. Since then, those living alongside the motorway say they've suffered sleepless nights because of the noise caused by traffic racing over the concrete slabs. The continuing drone of the traffic sounds as if a, a jet is back firing uh, you know, during uh, landing. And it's terrible. You can hear it from over there, over there, and over there. The noise level is intolerable. It's sort of all day, all night, and it is so loud that you just cannot get on with your life how you used to. The noise problem results from the anti-skid surface incorporated in the concrete roadway. It causes air to be expelled from grooves as tyres pass over. On top of that, vehicles make a thumping noise as they bounce over the deep ruts. This afternoon, families from Charing Heath heard from their local councillor that protection from the high noise level was essential. 
put an acoustic barrier or some form of bunding. I don't think tree screening will actually achieve a lot. Tree screening doesn't actually cut down noise. We really need some form of acoustic barrier through the area. In the meantime, villagers will be inviting the Transport Secretary, Malcolm Rifkin, to spend a night with them to hear the noise at first hand. We'll be at Coast to Coast, Charing Heath. A Broadstairs firm has made 13 people redundant despite landing a lucrative contract at Euro Disneyland. Blaise Neon will make more than 600 signs for the theme park near Paris. The company recently took over another firm with 38 staff and says there was overmanning as a result. Armed police search Woodland near Tunbridge Wells after an armed robbery at a grocer's shop. The man, wearing a blue boiler suit and a black balaclava, threatened the shopkeeper at the Mace store in Church Road, Pembury, and stole £70. He ran off and disappeared into nearby woods. A young Kent mother is to sue the Medway Health Authority over the death of her two-year-old son. Michael Taylor died from meningitis. His younger brother, Sammy, died from the same virus weeks earlier. Debbie Taylor claims she told doctors at All Saints Hospital in Chatham that Michael had meningitis, but they didn't believe her until it was too late. A Kent teacher convicted of stealing two canoes from the school where he worked has been given a six-month suspended sentence. 44-year-old Paul Newman from Gillingham must also pay £200 costs. Earlier this month, the jury at Maidstone Crown Court found him guilty of stealing the canoes from Waldersley Boys' School while he was in charge of outdoor pursuits. A waste treatment process developed at the University of Kent has won an award. Viridian Bioprocessing Limited won the small business category in the Daily Telegraph National Westminster Bank Clean Technology Awards. It offers a unique service for detoxifying industrial waste. The service is based on a technique that was developed and patented at the University of Kent. People in Essex are being urged to take a shower instead of a bath and put a brick in their toilet cisterns to conserve water. The Hanningford Reservoir near Wickford, which serves most of South Essex, is only 80% full. The Essex Water Company introduced sprinkler and hosepipe bands last summer. They're still in force. The Mid-Kent Water Company is also maintaining hosepipe bands as it tries to conserve low water supplies. Children from all over Kent gathered at an awards ceremony in Canterbury to find out who'd won a competition to design the House of the Future. The overall winner was 11-year-old Natalie Jenkins from New Ash Green with a design for an environmentally friendly treehouse. The judges, the Lee Evans Architectural Partnership, said green ideas were a major aspect of all the entries. Gangs of youths who wash car windscreens in traffic jams should be stopped, according to the AA. The trend started in America and is spreading throughout the southeast. The youngsters can earn up to £50 a day. It's not illegal. But as Mark Bishop reports, the gangs can be intimidating and a hazard to road safety. Rush hour traffic means good business for the windscreen washer gangs of Brighton. It's illegal to ask for money for the service, so this man, who didn't want to be named, invites motorists to make a donation which ranges from 50 pence to two pounds. The AA says the cleaners are intimidating, a nuisance and a threat to road safety. What happens yeah. when the lights change to green and you're still halfway cleaning a windscreen? Well, that doesn't happen. And if it ever should get to that state, then I leave the windscreen. Um, you I've need the windscreen. Clean windscreen. How can you see the lights behind you? If you've got your mind on the windscreen. Well, I'm almost sort of watching sideways onto the lights, so I can I keep see. one eye on the lights. And it doesn't actually present a danger to anybody. I've been doing this for quite a while now, and nobody's had any cause for complaints about me putting either myself or any other any other person in danger. The motorists themselves agreed that the service was not causing a hazard or endangering anybody. What do you think about these windscreen washer uh, boys here? Well, it's okay if they want to make some money out of it. I suppose it's all right if they don't make a separate living, I suppose. I'll do no harm. A bit of private enterprise. That's it. I'm all, all for that. But the AA says the practice is dangerous and wants the government to take action. When they start cleaning windscreens, they block up the road, they tend to uh, obstruct the traffic, and it's just a real danger to motorists. Would you like to see them outlawed? Yes, we would, because we can see it being the start of a trend, and who knows what it might lead to with people carrying out businesses in traffic queues and demanding money in a very intimidating manner. The House of Lords has already tried unsuccessfully to get the practice banned. Now the AA is to try and put more pressure on the government before someone gets seriously injured.
Mark Bishop, Coast to Coast, Brighton. Now, a warning to shoppers tonight. It is that supermarket trolleys can damage your health. It's being claimed that they cause countless back injuries because they're difficult to unload and sometimes impossible to steer. Philip Hornby reports. The supermarket trolley is crying out for a radical redesign. So says the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists. It says its members are constantly reporting cases of trolley-related back injuries. One of the biggest problems that can occur is, is actually a spasming here between the shoulder blades because you're pushing the trolley, if it stops suddenly or there's too much weight in it, and then you find that you get tight between the shoulder blades. The other major problem, of course, is down here in the low back where if there's a sudden stop on the trolley or you try to pull it to one side, these muscles will grab tight in order to protect the back and they get an all or nothing response and really go into spasm. And shoppers agree, trolleys can cause a whole load of trouble. They wriggle all the way, they, they don't go straight, you know, and you have to keep turning them. I think the wheels are going one way and I'm going another way. I find it very hard with these, I really do. They're better to pull them than to push. The retail consortium, whose membership includes most supermarket chains, not surprisingly defends trolley design. Trolleys have to be designed for a number of reasons. I and mean, you can see here, this lady has lots of shopping. She has a child as well. So it has to be a trolley, a convenient trolley for her, so that she can feel safe as she's shopping and making sure that her child is safe as well. The British Standards Institute has, though, been asked to check out the problem and it's expected to come up with some new ideas for redesign. In the meantime, perhaps, the best way to protect your back is to shop just a bit at a time and to use a basket. Philip Hornby, Coast to Coast. Now, a bank manager is specialising in raising interest in his local Chinese restaurant. While diners tuck into their Peking duck, the Chinese pop songs which accompany the meal come courtesy of the man from the Nat West. David Forsdyke reports. Bob Nichols looks every inch a bank manager, but when all his clients have left, Bob picks up his sheet music and heads for his favourite Chinese restaurant just down the road. Because Bob is more than happy to take it away in the middle of other people's Chinese meals. The music really is Chinese. It might sound like a nondescript tinkling, but it can grow on you. Two years ago, this was a monster hit in Hong Kong. So how did Bob the Banker get to be plugged as the noodle eater's equivalent of Elton John? I love the food. The music intrigues me. I uh, can't understand a word of it, but something mysterious. Is it easy to play? You don't know the words, you don't know the titles, you know very little, but... You have to, you have to sight read it, uh, mostly in the minor key, but uh, once you get hold of it, it's OK. Chinese music isn't nearly as popular as the food, but they can go well together. He's a band like a good piano player. I mean, um, this guy has a great character, I mean, and I like his music. We enjoy having him here. And just before we leave Tunbridge Wells' musical bank manager, a special rendition, Chopsticks. <laughs> David Forsyth, Coast to Coast, Tunbridge Wells. My bank manager's not a bit like that. Anyway, time for sport and Chris Morn. Chris. Thank you, Natalie. First, it's cricket on a day when former Kent wicketkeeper Paul Downton has been forced to retire from the game because of an eye injury. His final match was at Hove, where his Middlesex teammates have been chasing victory against Sussex. Downton's last day in action was a profitable one. He saw John Embury take seven wickets as Sussex were bowled out for 203. Downton's eyesight hasn't recovered properly since he was hit in the eye by a bale last season. I think in my own mind I now realise that um, there are too many uncertainties as far as keeping wicked is concerned. And there are too many days in which I feel vulnerable um, and just don't catch the ball properly that uh, I think it's sensible to uh, call it a day. One last walk to the pavilion for Downton and a chance to reflect on a career of more than 600 catches and over 80 stumpings. And it all began in Kent. When I was born and brought up in Kent, my father played some games for Kent as well, so uh, I still have a bit of an identity crisis from time to time, and I always enjoy going back there. Um, it's a marvellous place to play, Canterbury, Maidstone, Tunbridge Wells, some lovely grounds, uh, and I'm sure I'll go back there and uh, 
see old mates again shortly. Well, Downton's final match is set for a tight finish, chasing 244 to win. Middlesex have made 176 for four, so they need another 68 from the last seven overs. At Chelmsford, Essex need to score 93 runs in their second innings for victory over Warwickshire, but they only have 15 overs to get them. After five, they're 26 for no wicket. At Trent Bridge, Kent required 264 in their second innings to beat Nottinghamshire, but it was always a tough proposition, and that match is heading for a draw. Meanwhile, former skipper Chris Cowdery and spin bowler Richard Davis are back in the Kent squad for the championship game against Derbyshire, which begins at Canterbury tomorrow. On to golf, and in the first round of the Volvo PGA Championship at Wentworth, Brighton's Chris Moody has shot a four under par 68, so he's five strokes behind the clear leader, Australian Wayne Riley. Jamie Spence from Tunbridge Wells and Paul Way from Tunbridge are also well placed. Both went round in 70. Meanwhile, putting like this has taken 17-year-old Karen Stupples into the semi-final of the English Women's Amateur Championship. Karen, who's a student at Thanet Technical College, won her quarter-final today by just one hole. Well, some news just in. The Sussex-Middlesex match at Hove, as I can tell you, has ended as a draw. That's the sport. Now it's Mike. Thanks, Chris. Now the uh, news reading department is going to glare balefully at the weather forecasting department, which has forecast that Natalie's barbecue tomorrow will have sunshine. Whether weather forecasters know what the sun is is another question. Yes, of course, the sun is uh, an astronomical phenomenon, not a meteorological phenomenon, so I'm not too sure about it. Actually, I think Natalie's barbecue and any other barbecues for tomorrow night are looking fairly reasonable. Whether it'll be sunshine or not, I... I wouldn't say. It'll certainly be dry, I think. Temperatures today got up to about 17 Celsius, but that was in the western half of the region, West Sussex, and in the later part of the afternoon, because, as I'm sure you realise, there's been a lot of cloud around, and there has been rain and drizzle across the region. That's because there's a very weak front. In fact, although many of you with barometers will stare at the needle and see it pointing to the very dry part of the range, you might be surprised to see the rain that was falling today because there is an area of shallow low pressure it depends on the way the wind is rotating whether it's a high or a low and the air, wind has been rotating very slowly in a counterclockwise direction across the southeast and east anglia looking at the satellite sequence you can see the cloud developing associated with this frontal system coming down from the north there's still the high pressure system blocked in the southwest approaches but there's that cloud developing and bringing that light rain and drizzle down across us. And as I say, that's associated with a very sh shallow region of low pressure, which is going to run away, and the region of high pressure is going to be building in, so that by noon tomorrow, the high itself will be the main feature, bringing in very mild, very humid west or northwesterly airstream across the whole of the country, and the problem will be fog and mist patches developing, especially tonight and probably tomorrow night. Tonight itself, then, temperatures not below about 50 Celsius. Uh, no, 50 Fahrenheit, not 50 <laughs> Celsius. My word, that's a bit warm. Anyway, not below uh, 50 Fahrenheit, 10 Celsius, but the problems are going to be the fog patches. So if you do have to be traveling tomorrow morning, if you are making a journey for the bank holiday weekend, do take care as you're traveling along the roads and watch out. There may well be the fog and uh, adjust your driving accordingly. Tomorrow itself, it's going to get up to about 22 and it'll be sunny and warm for most of the region. There's still the problem over the Thames estuary area with the air coming in off a chilly North Sea, but I think that it'll be quite a pleasant day. Looking ahead through the bank holiday weekend, the suggestions are that it's going to become cooler on the east coast as these northerly winds come down the North Sea once again, but mostly dry and sunny. Weddings around tomorrow, there's uh, Elizabeth and Richard, Angela and Andrew, Elaine and Fraser, Tina and Keith and Cynthia and Colin. And our picture tonight comes from Victoria Kinsman of Strood. A pleasant bank holiday weekend for Natalie's barbecue. Thanks, Ron. You better be right. Now for a recap of the main stories in the southeast tonight. A young couple who locked a two-year-old boy in a room where he eventually died have been jailed for six months for willful neglect. A student has received a telephone bill for £8,500. Russell Codling says two people used his phone to make calls across the world while he was in lectures. And people living alongside the new stretch of the M20 between Maidstone and Ashford have complained the road's too noisy because of its special surfacing. That's it. Have a lovely weekend. We'll see you next week. Good night. Bye-bye.
In just under 10 minutes, That's Gardening visits the Chelsea Flower Show and talks to Stephanie Powers, Pam Ayres, David Bellamy and Alan Titchmarsh. First on TVS, we join Shaw Taylor for Police Five.